The title of the sermon this morning is called Understanding the Trinity. Understanding the Trinity. The, the Trinity is a, quite a complex topic and it always comes up in conversation. You know, when you're trying to explain the gospel, how is Jesus God and whatnot. And I'm not saying that we can necessarily fully comprehend how it all hangs together. You know, like you can uh, look under the hood of a car and just go, hey, that's how it works. But that's what I'm going to try and attempt to explain this morning. So when I explain the Trinity to people and how the Trinity works, how God was manifest in the flesh, um, I put this diagram together to help you understand uh, what I'm seeing or how I think it all hangs together. But ultimately, it's, it's all the one God. So we'll start here in 1 Timothy 3.16, where it says here, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, this verse is not saying that the mystery of godliness is still a mystery. Right? This, this, this verse is actually telling us what the mystery of godliness is. So sometimes people use this verse to say, well, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness to say, well, you know what? We can't really understand at all how God works and, and uh, you know, it's, it's all too complicated and, and it's not something that we can really understand. Well, I don't believe that. I think it's something we can understand. It doesn't necessarily mean we know how it all hangs together, but the Bible gives us enough information to know, hey, this is what we know about God. This is what God has revealed to us in his word about his nature and how it all works and how it uh, hangs together in the sense, but we don't necessarily know, you know, the, the pipes and all that sort of stuff. So we know that this is how God works and we're told this is how God works, but we don't necessarily know, you know, like I said, under the hood of God. So what is the mystery talking about here? This verse is not even really talking about the Trinity as such, the three in one, right? What is the mystery that this verse is talking about? This verse is talking about the fact that God was manifest in the flesh. So that is one of the complications of God's nature as well, that this God who is a spirit entered into the physical world and was manifest in the flesh. So this verse is stating that there is a mystery not that it still is a mystery. The mystery is that God was manifest in the flesh. And this is a great verse to show that God, Jesus Christ, is God. Because God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ was that. Jesus Christ is God. So even though the mystery may be difficult to comprehend, it doesn't mean it's, no, it doesn't mean it's still a mystery. right? So as I go through this sermon, I'm going to start building on this canvas here. Oh, it's a bit cut off at the top there. Oh, we can see here, this side represents the spiritual realm. And this side is going to represent the physical realm. And we can see here that there's the mystery that is being revealed to us, that the God that existed in the spiritual realm was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. Now let's first talk about the paradox. The paradox. Yeah, thanks, Gersh. So the reason why it's a, it's a little bit difficult to comprehend the nature of God is because the nature of God is somewhat paradoxical. What is a paradox? A paradox is two statements that seemingly contradict, but they are both true. This, and there are two paradoxes with God, right? There's the three in one, and there's the fact that God, uh, Jesus Christ is both man and God. So let's talk first about the, the Trinity paradox, right? The fact that God is three in one. We see this in 1 John 5, which is why we started there. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, this is why this verse in 1 John 5, 7 is so hotly disputed because it's the clearest place in the Bible that the Trinity is stated, right? It says there are three that bear record in heaven. It gives us the three persons within the Trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then it says, and these three are one. So this is this paradox here. Now, people will 
you know, get up in arms or they'll dispute over what are the right terms to describe these three that are one within the Trinity. And some people will say, hey, it's, it's one essence and three persons. It's three persons and one spirit, uh, you know. But ultimately, no matter what you boil it down to, no matter what words you, you use, a paradox is there because you have one God who operates in the first person, I, that, are, that is three, Father, Word, and Holy Spirit, and each of them operate in the first person as well. So no matter which way you, whatever word you use to describe these three and one, you ultimately come to the same point where you have three that are one at the same time. Okay, so let's go back to our canvas here. We've got 1 John 5, 7. We have Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. Now, the, the best term that I think is the term to describe these are spirits, because this is what we see in 1 John 5. You see here it says here in verse 6, and it is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. And then it says, for there are three that bear record. So you have the spirit bearing witness, but you also have three that bear record. And each of the three within that spirit are spirits as well, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. So we use the term persons to describe identities, the fact that it's, you know, the reason why they call the spirit a person is because they, they're trying to make the point that it's not an impersonal force. It's not just an it. It's not just something that exists, but doesn't have a personality behind it. But God is not an impersonal force, right? So that's why they say it's a person. But there are three persons there, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But then the thing is, that one that they are is a singular person as well. But rather than get confused by the term person, I think the best term to actually use is the word spirit, that there are three spirits that are the one spirit. And that's that paradox that we see. So we have Father, Word, Holy Ghost that exist in the spiritual realm. And I have them in this order because there is somewhat of a hierarchy between them, that the Holy Ghost is subject to the Word, right? The Holy Ghost is sent by the Word. The Father speaks the Word. So this is why I have it in this order. And the reason why I have the Word touching here is because what we'll see in the Bible is whenever God interacts with the physical realm, it's always through His Word. Right? This, is why the, this is why the Word of God, the Spirit of God is the Word of God. And when we know when the Word of God is moving, like we see in John 3, it interacts with the spiritual realm by what we hear. So how do we know the Spirit of God? Because we hear the Word of God. You see, that's how the, the, the God interacts with the physical realm. And this is why it's interesting that it was the Word that was made flesh, because it's, again, it's the Word that interacts with the physical realm. But the Word is God, and we're going to go into that. So we have the three in 1 John 5, 7. But like I said, as we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, we also have God, the Spirit Himself, who speaks as I. Isaiah 43, 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, who I am chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So you see how we can't just have these three completely separate, right? Because there's only one God, and he says, I, even I, and then beside me there is no Savior. There's no other God formed. So if we keep the three separate, that's also false doctrine as well, because then you're going to have three, you're going to end up with three gods. So there are three, but the paradox is these three are still one. So uh, we'll add to our canvas here. We have Father, Word, Holy Ghost, but the three are also one God. There is this trinity that is occurring here in the spiritual realm. Now, people use different analogies to try and understand the trinity, and all of them you know, really come short to a certain extent because you, you know, you can't have a paradox in the physical world, right? You can't have two things that are both simultaneously true, whereas God exists outside this world and this is why his nature can be paradoxical, it can be two things at the same time because God is not limited by this world. But what are some analogies that people use to describe God? Well, one might be 
you know, people will say an egg is, you know, on an, in an egg, you've got the shell, you've got the, the yolk, and then you've got the white, but it's one egg. And, and why does that analogy come short? Because, you know, it may work where you say, hey, well, the, the yolk is distinct from the white and the white's distinct from the shell. But why it comes short is because the yolk is not 100% of the egg. The white is not 100% of the egg as well. The shell is not 100% of the egg. So we don't believe in what's called partialism when you take one part of the Trinity and they all make up one God, but they're all one third of God. That doesn't work that way. But with the analogy of the egg, that's why that analogy comes short. But people use that analogy to try and say, okay, well, there's three parts that kind of make up God. And, you know, in a sense, there's these three identities or persons or spirits that make up the one spirit, but it's not exactly the same. Um, people might use the analogy of a band. You know, and this is uh, generally the Orthodox Trinitarians will say, you know, the band is, you know, what brings them together. The band is not like an entity in and of itself. It's just an essence that they share. And then you have the singer, you have the guitarist, and you have the drummer. And these three people make up the band. And, you know, they think the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost make up God in that sense, that they, the three are in a band. But, you know, again, that's not a perfect analogy because the band itself also speaks in the first person I, like we see on Isaiah 43. Uh, another analogy people may use when they talk about us as people, you know, us, we are made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. And that is a very close analogy because we'll say, hey, well, the body, you know, and the soul are distinct. The soul is distinct from the spirit, the spirit distinct from the body, but the person itself describes itself as I. But where I think the analogy falls down with the body, soul, and spirit, because where it does work is it has one person I, right? And you even have parts of that body, like, you know, when we say things like the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you can actually see that there is interaction, you know, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. So that you can see there's even interaction between elements within that person. But where I think the analogy falls down is that the flesh is not the spirit, right? The, the spirit is not the body. Whereas when we see, when we look at verses with God, the word is the spirit. God is the, God the Father is the spirit, right? So they are each other as well as being distinct from one another. And this is why every analogy kind of has its flaws. Another analogy people use to try and understand the Trinity is the roles of a person. You can say one person is a father, a husband, and a brother. Now that as well has some truths to it too, because you know we, we have the one person that is operating in three different ways. But then you say, well, the analogy where it falls down there is the father does not interact with the husband because they're the one person. So this is why all these analogies have some flaw in them, but the analogies can help us to understand, you know, why there is, you know, uh, you know, a, a three-in-one being, how a three-in-one being can exist. Now, I think the best analogy to use is the idea of water, right? Like water exists in three states, a solid, a liquid, and a gas, but all of them is water, right? So that's why water can exist in three states, and it's the same with God. God exists in three states, Father, Word, Holy Ghost. And these states can interact with one another, like you can have a glass of iced water. But when you have a glass of iced water, you're still ultimately drinking water. Now, the reason why I think water is, is a good analogy, and I'll just preface it by saying, you know, it's not that I believe that God changes from one form to another, right? So think of it like all the water in the world exists in three states in some form or another. And it's like God. God exists in three states, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. And he's always that, but then they are all the one God as well. Now, the reason why I think water is the best analogy for the Spirit is because the Bible actually uses the analogy of water for the Spirit in the Bible. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Look at John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And look at this in verse 39. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, let's look at some others. Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. So he's saying like he blesses the ground with the water and the showers, he's saying he's going to pour the spirit on them so that they have a blessing on their offspring and whatnot. So it's like he's blessed, like blessing the fruit of the ground, and then he's going to pour the spirit to bless the seed and the fruit of actual people. Right? So this idea of pouring the spirit comes from the analogy of the spirit being like water. Acts 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Um, and, on the, and on thy servants and on thy handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So again, that analogy of the spirit being poured out like a liquid. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, this is Acts 10, 45, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Think about baptism. Matthew 3, 11. This is John the Baptist speaking here. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So what is baptism representing, right? It's representing the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So you see, this is why I think water is a very good analogy for the Spirit. Not only do you have the solid liquid gas, right, water, ice, and steam, but even the Spirit is being poured out. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is being represented, represented by baptism with water. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and look, and have been all made to, look, drink into one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. See, washed with water, but ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by, yeah, the Spirit of our God. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So you can definitely see that there is a strong tie between the analogy of water and the spirit. And I just think it works well with solid liquid gas. And, you know, you can think of it that way, that ice is just as much water as steam, right? But they just exist in different states. So, when you think of analogies, this can help you to understand the Trinity. Not all analogies are perfect, but I think the best analogy is water. It's not perfect, but it's definitely the analogy that is used in the Bible. Now, I want to tell you this story of a 2D world. And this, this, this story really helps me to understand how God can exist in a paradox, right? And, and what, remember we said that paradox is that he's both three and one at the same time. So we don't believe in modalism where God is shifting forms into three different forms. We don't believe in partialism where God is, you know, made up of three parts and each of these parts is just a one third of God. We believe the Trinity like the Bible teaches the Trinity, which is you have three distinct identities, Father, Word, Holy Ghost, but all three of them are each other, and there's one identity as well that is all three of them, right? So this is this paradox that there is not three and one. There, there, there's three and one at the same time, right? It's not one or the other. It is both. Just like, you know, when we talk about Jesus being man and God, it's not one or the other. And this is why, you know, it's, it's very hard to sometimes explain this to people that don't understand or don't believe what God has revealed in his word because it's not one or the other. It's both. 
Jesus Christ is both God and both man. Now, if we think about a 2D world, this is where we can help us to get our head around why a being that exists in a world outside of the one that we live in is almost impossible for us to comprehend how it all hangs together when that being interacts with the 3D world. Because if we imagine us as a 3D being interacting with a 2D world, you can see the same limitations on those that exist in the 2D world. So how does this analogy go, this story go? So you have Mr. Green here. Mr. Green in this 2D world, so if you imagine this plane exists in a 2D world, right? So this is Mr. Green. Now, we can see that Mr. Green is green because we exist in a 3D world, right? Because we can see it from this angle. But, but Mr. Green can't, right? If you can imagine a 2D world, he exists on that plane, right? Now let's say Mr. Green meets Mr. Blue. Now we can see that he is green and we can see that he is blue, but what does Mr. Green see when he meets Mr. Blue? And likewise, when Mr. Blue meets Mr. Green, what do they see in this 2D plane? They see a line, right? So this is interesting as well because now it makes you kind of, you know, I'm not saying it works exactly like this, but you can kind of understand that somebody who exists outside of our world can see things that we can't. So it's like, you know, we say God can see our faith. God can see our heart. He can see things. Well, it's like here, we can see things that they can't. They can see a line, but we can see what's inside them, right? We can see the green and we can see the blue, just like God can see what's inside of us. So I think this analogy and this story works really well. So that's what they see. And you know, and even if they were to circle each other, they're going to just see the same line, if you understand <laughs> geometry. Now, let's say Mr. Green is here, you know, on his own and, you know, he has a, an experience with somebody outside of that world. So let's say I'm here and let's say I stick my finger into this plane, right? Now, all of a sudden something appears, right, to Mr. Green. Now, that's my finger going through that plane. Now, what does Mr. Green see when my finger goes through that plane? He's going to see this line all of a sudden appear. Right? That's, that's Victor interacting with this 2D world, right? Now let's say in another instance, Mr. Blue has an encounter with God or has, has a revelation from God. And this time I stick three fingers into this plane, right? So that's my three fingers into this plane. What is Mr. Blue going to see, right? He's going to see three lungs. Now let's say now Mr. Green and Mr. Blue get together and talk about what God has revealed to them about, well, you know, what Victor has revealed to them about the nature of Victor. Well, obviously Mr. Green is going to say, no, I, I, Victor, Victor revealed himself as one line, right? Because it's one finger going through there. They don't know that it's a finger, right? They just know that, hey, this is how it's, he's, he's manifested into this world, how we know how he looks. And Mr. Blue is going to say, no, 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 I saw three fingers. And then that's when the sparks fly, right? Is he one? Is he three? And they're going to be arguing and they know. And, and, and that's like us arguing over what we see in the Bible, because sometimes we see three in the Bible and other times we see one. But what is the actual truth? The actual truth is that there is a three in one being. So I know I'm making the point that I'm just sticking my fingers into this plane, but that's not what God's doing, right? God's not just manifesting himself in different ways. It's that he is three and he is one, and that's the two different things that we see in the Bible. And Christians obviously fight over it and unfortunately divide over it and whatnot, but this is, should not be the case. It should be Christians being able to discuss, hey, how has God revealed himself to us in his word? And let's try and understand the full picture, right? So if you understand this story of a 3D being interacting with a 2D world, it helps you to understand why God can be two things at once because God is a being outside of our world that is interacting with our world, revealing himself to this world. And we see there the, the one spirit that is also three spirits, Father, Word, Holy Ghost. And then the mystery of God Right? The mystery of godliness is what? That that spirit then entered into 
and was incarnate, was manifest in the flesh. And that again is, a, is another paradox. There are two paradoxes going on. So let me try and break this down into a visual diagram. So I've talked about this before because I've obviously preached on this topic before. But hopefully this gives you, as I, as, I, as I talk about it again, a good understanding of this is what I'm seeing. See, so when I try and explain the Trinity to people, I try and explain the interaction between the, the spiritual and the physical, this is the diagram I put together in my head, and this is how I think it, it all hangs together. Right? This is my theory. So let's go through this visual diagram. So first of all, Let's start off at John 1.1, 1, 1, where, we, where we clearly see this paradox at play as well between the Father and the Word. So John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So not only do we have 1 John 5.7 that says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and all the ghosts, and these three are one. This as well tells us about the paradox within that trinity between the Father and the Word, that you have the, the Word was with God and the Word was God. So let's go back to our canvas here and we're going to like start drawing some lines to, to represent the relationship between these three. So here we've got John 1.1, 1, 1, right? So we got the, the Father is the Word and the Word is the Father because we're getting it from here. The Word was with God, right? So there at one point distinct, but the Word was God, right? So that is here. Now, how do we know in John 1.1 1, 1, that the word God there is referring to God the Father? Well, we compare this to 1 John 1, right? 1 John 1, look at what it says here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was, look at this, with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So if we compare spiritual with spiritual, we can see that in 1 John 1, what was the word with in the beginning? It was with the Father. So this is why we know that in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What well, was it with the Father? But then it also then says, and the Word was God. The Word was God the Father. So this is why I think in our diagram, we can say the Word is the Father. The Father is the Word, but the Father is also with the Word. So we got 1 John 1, 1 to 2. Now, this is the problem I have with the traditional Trinitarian diagram. See, the reason why they draw it this way where there's God in the middle, because they don't believe that these are each other as well. But we just saw in John 1.1 1, 1, that you have the Father and the Word, which they have as the Son here, right? Uh, that, that, that they are with one another, but they also are each other as well. Whereas the traditional teaching of the Trinity, the Orthodox Trinity, say that they just share this essence. So that's why they have they use that analogy like the band, you know, like the egg. You know, it's like there's three of them, uh, but they never really come together as one. They just share like this same substance. The other problem I have with this diagram is it uses the term here. The Father is not the Son. You know, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. And... I don't believe this is biblical because when we look at the verses, we will see that they are each other as well. So not only are they distinct, but they are each other. We already saw that in John 1.1. 1, 1. So you'll never see in the Bible where it says the Son is not the Father. They just assume because they're distinct, they're not each other. But that's not the terminology that the Bible uses. Like in John 1.1, 1, 1, the terminology that the Bible uses is they are with one another and they are one another. Now let's fill out the rest of this diagram. So now let's look at the Word and the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 6, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, look at this, which is the Word of God. So we see here the Spirit is the Word of God, right? Even though you have 
Father, Word, Holy Ghost. The Word is the Holy Ghost and vice versa, like we see here in Ephesians 6, 17. So let's add that to our diagram here. Word is Holy Ghost. That's that inner line. But the Holy Ghost is also with the Word. Let's have a look at the verse here in John 16. John 16, 13, where we see them distinct here. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. So you see the words that the Holy Ghost is speaking are not his own words. But who, who, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So there you can see there that he's taking of God's word, right? And Jesus is specifically talking about himself there. He's taking of the word of God and speaking of words, the Holy Spirit, that are not his. So you see a distinction there between the word of God and the Holy Spirit, which are the words that the Holy Spirit is speaking. John 16, 13. So let's add that to our diagram here. So we got John 16, the word is with the Holy Ghost because they're distinct there. But Ephesians 6, 17 is saying the word of God, the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now let's go on. Now let's look at the Father and the Holy Spirit, right? Father and the Holy Ghost. John 4, 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, like I said before, where the best, I think, term for the three is these three spirits in one, we see here the Father is also a spirit. We know the Word of God is a spirit, right? Because Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And of course, the Holy Spirit is a spirit, right? So this is why I think three spirits that are one spirit. Spirit is like water. Water is a great analogy. So here's the verse where we see, hey, God the Father, because God here is talking about the Father, worshipping the Father, saying God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But the Father is the Spirit. But look at this verse in Romans 8. This is where we see that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and even the Spirit of Christ are like all one and the same thing. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So what's that? That's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit dwells in you. Now, if any man have not, look at this, the Spirit of what? Christ. He is none of his. So you see, the Holy Spirit in you is the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead so who is him that raised up Jesus from the dead? That's the Father. The Father raised up Jesus from the dead. So it's saying now the Spirit of the Father dwells in you. So you see that Spirit. There's not three spirits dwelling in you. There's one Spirit dwelling in you, but that one Spirit is all three of them. That raised up Christ from the dead, from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Okay, so now we have Romans. 8, 9 to 11, we know that the Father is a spirit, but we know that they are each other because the spirit is dwelling in you and it's referring to them all as the spirit of Christ or the spirit as spirit of Christ, spirit of God, spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. So let's see here now the Father being distinct from the Holy Ghost. John 14, 16. Look at what Jesus says here. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you, what it says here, another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So this, in this verse, we can see that the Father is distinct from the comforter, who is the Holy Ghost. So we put John 14, 16 there, is with the Father. All right? So when I think of the Trinity, Notice how we haven't got to this point yet, right? Which was the God manifest in the flesh. Because the way I see it is the Trinity exists in the spiritual realm, right? It is the three in one spirit 
that is being described here. Now, like I said, we can't necessarily just see it. Like we are like the 2D people trying to comprehend the 3D world, right? Mr. Blue and Mr. Green. But what has been revealed to us in God's word, this is what we can see so far, that there are three spirits that are the one spirit, that they are distinct from one another, but they are one another. They're one and three at the same time, right? That's the spirit of God. Now, when we think about the common terms that are used in the Bible, the term God generally refers to the father aspect of that trinity. Like it says here in 1 Corinthians 8, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus, by whom are all things, and we by him. So I'm just going to put a dotted line here to say even though we know this is all God, right? It's not like God is just one part of it. Generally, when the Bible is referring to the word God, it is referring to that aspect, right? The aspect that God is our Father in heaven. But again, the Father is also these things. So we can't just separate off the Father. The Father is one in the three of this three-in-one God that is the God of the Bible. Now, there's a term that has been given to the Holy Ghost, John 14, 26, but the Comforter, we saw that in some other verses, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So again, we have the term the Comforter in John 14, 26, that generally, generally refers to the Holy Ghost, but again, that doesn't mean the Holy Ghost can be separated off. The Holy Ghost is still the Father, still the Word. They're with one another. They all are each other. That's, that's the God. But then, like I said, we have these terms in the Bible that refer to different aspects, uh, and, and that's the way they're commonly used, but it's still all the one God, right? You can't, like I said, you can't separate it off. Now, let's talk about this mystery that God was manifest in the flesh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know that God was manifest in the flesh, the incarnation. And it says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his truth. So I've got here made, John 1.14, the word was made flesh. But can we say that Jesus Christ is only the word? No, because you can't just like detach the word and say Jesus Christ is only the word and this whole other apparatus doesn't exist, right? So yes, while it says the word was made flesh, why? Because the word is what interacts with the physical realm. You know, we hear the word of God and this is why the word is made man of flesh because the word, like I said, is what interacts with the physical realm. So we have John 1, 14, the word was made flesh. But we also see this going back the other way as well. I don't know if you know that. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Look at what it says here. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So you have the word made flesh, but you also have the last man made a quickening spirit. And when we go to John 6, 63, the word of God is that quickening spirit. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So you can see that it's building this here, right? The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The word was made flesh. Now, why do I say, even though the Bible describes it as, like we have these common terms, like God is the Father, comfort is the Holy Ghost, we have the word here referring to what's interacting with the physical realm, with the, the actual spoken word of God and the word of God incarnate, which was Jesus Christ. But like I said, it's not that he's just one third of God, one third of this Trinity. He's the whole thing as well. Because you have also verses, right? Like here in, uh, let me just skip forward a bit because I just want to show you here in uh, Colossians 2. But the Bible says here, Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this is why you can't separate him off. Now, this man that was made flesh, we're just going to go back. What is the term referred to, this man that was in the flesh? 
Well, Luke 1, 35, it says here, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So when we refer to the Son of God, the Son of God is that Spirit of God made flesh. So people say, well, which one is Jesus? Is he the Son of God or is he God? Well, it's because he's both, because it's that Spirit that became flesh, right? So this is why there is this paradox as well. This is why if you understand, there's not just one paradox at play here. There's two paradoxes at play. One paradox exists in the spiritual realm, which is there are three spirits that are the one spirit. The other paradox that is going on is this great mystery of godliness, where God was manifest in the flesh, where Jesus Christ is not just man, because it's not that this is disconnected here, but he's man because he was manifest in the flesh, but he is also the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the picture of God is not just this. It's not just this, it's the whole thing, right? This is all of God, right? And it's all going on all at the same time and different aspects are being alluded to in different scriptures within the Bible. Now, what is the name of the Son of God? Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. So just like we talked about common terms, God referring to the aspect of God the Father, the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. Jesus, even though we see in the Bible Jesus being referred to as other things, most commonly it's referring to the Son of God. It's referring to the man, Christ Jesus. This is why when you see salutations in the Bible and you're always wondering, you know, well, these salutations are referring to God, the Godhead, why does it only ever refer to God the Father and Jesus Christ? You know, you see those salutations, the Holy Ghost is always missing. Well, it's because it's not referring to this and this, it's referring to this and this. But then God can also refer to this as well as the Father. Hopefully, I'm not confusing you guys. Okay, so Jesus, in the most part, refers to the Son of God. Now, what about the term Christ? So you have the word Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is not his first name and last name, right? So it's not like Christ is his family name, and then that's where you get Jesus Christ from. The reason why he's called Jesus Christ is because he is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And Christ as well is referring to that man in the flesh. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John 1, 41. This is the disciples here. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, so the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So now we can see how this hangs together, where we have the Son of God, God made flesh. He was called Jesus. And that son is Jesus, the Christ, because the Christ has come into the world, is manifest in the flesh. But again, that Christ is the spirit that was manifest in the flesh. Now, let me show you some other relationships in this diagram. All right. So we already talked about Colossians 2.9. And this is why I'm saying the son of God is not only the word. And this is where the difference in how people see the Trinity so, for example, let's think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying to the Father. What is going on there? Is that this entity within the Trinity talking to this entity within the Trinity? No, it's not. It is this man interacting with the spiritual God, right? So it's just the difference there in terms of how you see things. So again, Jesus, like I said, is not just the Word of God. He is the whole fullness of the Godhead bodily. But the reason why the Bible refers to the Word made flesh is because the Word is what interacts with the physical realm. Let's look at some other verses to show the connection even between 
Jesus and God. Right? Isaiah 9, 6. Look what it says here. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this is where the, the, the regular, you know, the Orthodox Trinitarians get a bit confused now because now they're figuring out how to fit Isaiah 9, 6 into their picture where the, their picture is saying, well, Jesus is just the Word, the Son, but then it says the Son is not the Father. But then now you have a verse that's saying, well, the Son that is given to us is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Whereas this picture fits them because this Son is this. So that's why there's no problem to say Jesus is the everlasting Father. He's God the Father, like we see in Isaiah 9, 6. Look at what John 8 says here, John 8, 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So you see how Jesus is saying here, you have to believe that Jesus is he. Otherwise you'll die in your sins. Now who is the he that he's referring to? Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he, right, that's he saying, I am he, he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things I have heard of him. Look at this in verse 27. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. You see, so that's Jesus there saying he is God the Father in the flesh. Why can he say that? Well, it's because the Son of God is God manifest in the flesh, and there's this three in one spirit that is Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. So Jesus is all of them. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's not saying anything wrong by saying he's God the Father. And Isaiah 9 6 is not saying anything wrong when it says the Son that is born, the Son that is given, is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 2 Peter 1 21. Let's now see a connection between Christ and the Comforter. We already saw it in Romans 8, but let's look at some other verses here. 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the prophets in old time, speaking the word of God, were speaking by what? The Holy Ghost. But look at what 1 Peter 1 says. This is the same, same author of this book, you know, that God was using to pen... To, to, to inspire these books. 1 Peter 1.10, it says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So he's talking about the Old Testament prophets preaching of salvation, preaching of the Messiah that was to come, searching what or what manner of time. Look at this. The Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So if holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and then 1 Peter 1 says, well, the thing, the ghost that was speaking in them was the Spirit of Christ. Doesn't that mean that Christ is the Holy Spirit? That's why Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. So I've written this here, 2 Peter 1, 21, right? The comforter, you know, speaking. 1 Peter 1, 11, the Spirit of Christ that was in them. We see it then again at a connection between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ and the Father. And of course, the connection here between Jesus and the Word is the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All right? So, where in the Bible do we see all three of them mentioned? Obviously, in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So why here is it referred to as Father, Son, Holy Ghost? So there's nothing wrong with referring to the Trinity as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But what, where it's kind of getting a bit technical and you know, where I make the distinction is the reason why you can refer to the Word as the Son is because this Son was made manifest, right? So we don't believe in the e eternal Sonship. We believe in incarnational Sonship, right? But this is why the Bible can still use the terms Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So there's nothing wrong 
with referring to the Trinity as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But what we understand from that is the reason why the Son is called the Son is because there was a moment in time, Luke 1.35, where the Son was manifest or the Son was born. And like I said, this Son was made a quickening spirit. So this is how it all ties in there. So Matthew 28, 19, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So this is how I believe it all hangs together, right? Compare, if you compare it to the traditional Orthodox Trinitary, Trin Trinity image, I think that does not tell the correct story, right? Because like I said, we do have verses in the Bible that say they are each other as well as with each other. And you need to understand that when we talk about the Trinity, we're not talking about the Father, the Man, and the Holy Spirit, right? When we're talking about the Trinity, the way I believe it works is the Trinity exists in the spiritual realm. There, is a, there are three spirits that are one. But the man Christ Jesus is not just the second person of the Trinity. The man Christ Jesus is that whole spirit, is the spirit of God manifest in the flesh. And this is where sometimes you get different interpretations of things in the Bible. Like I said, in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they will see the Garden of Gethsemane as first person talking to the second person. Whereas we would see it as, no, it is the spirit of God interacting with the man Christ Jesus. Okay? So, look, that may be a bit complicated. You may need to go back and listen to this sermon again, go back and look at the references. But what I'm trying to do in this sermon is give you a good understanding of if we were to look at how God works, how does it work? When you're trying to describe it to people, what's the image you're trying to describe? I drew this diagram to help you try and understand where the paradoxes exist, right? So that's one paradox. And then the other paradox is between spirit and man. Now, in conclusion, so when we see God, and I've talked about this before, when we see God, what will we see? Well, we don't have to wonder because in Acts 7, we saw already Stephen look into heaven and see and describe to us what he saw. So Acts 7, 55, it says here, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So notice he didn't just look directly at the Spirit of God, but he saw the glory of God. There was a light coming from God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So I believe when we actually see God, that's what we're going to see. There's going to be someone on the throne, but you can't see it, right? Because it's the Spirit of God on the throne, and you'll just see the glory, right? You're not going to be able to look directly at but you're going to be able to see the man Christ Jesus, like in Revelation, the lamb that's in the throne. So that's what I believe what, we, what we're going to see if we're in the throne of God, because we live on the new earth forever, but when we are in heaven for a temporary time, that I believe is what we're going to see. And it said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Now, many fight and divide you know, over this doctrine. But you know what's important? As long as your view of God does not deny the deity of Christ. See, that is the problem. When you talk about people that deny the Trinity, the problem is not that they have a different understanding of how the Trinity hangs together. The problem is, is that their understanding of the Trinity breaks the connection between, like I said, the Son of God on the right and God. So you need to keep that connection. You need the Son must be God in the flesh, like Jesus said. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So anyone that has a view of the Trinity that rejects the deity of Jesus Christ, that's when you enter into heresy. But, you know, if you have an understanding of the Trinity that does not deny the deity of Jesus Christ, then this is where Christians don't need to fight and divide over this doctrine. You know, you should be able to, you know, peacefully discuss this, you know, as we try and understand the full nature of God. And I hope today's sermon has given you a better understanding of that. All right, let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. And, uh, Lord, help us to study, help us to understand it. 
And your nature is uh, just one of those things that, you know, is alluded to throughout the whole Bible, but is one of those things that Christians fight, divide over. I pray, Lord, that that not be the case. I pray, Lord, that, you know, there's, an, there's plenty of things to fight in this world, Lord. And I just pray that this is not one of them. This is something that, you know, just creates uh, deep spiritual discussions where people can really get into the nuts and bolts of your word and, Lord, grow in our understanding of you. So we thank you and uh, pray, Lord, that you'll use this sermon to give people a better understanding, give them more confidence in this doctrine because it's a doctrine that is often challenged and used to make people doubt their faith. So help us, Lord, to have a good understanding, know that you are a God outside this world, and Lord, you are the true three-in-one God. We pray in your precious name. Amen.